we're analyzing music, even without thinking about it, we often reduce the musical surface to something more tangible, something easier to understand. If we're analyzing this piece of orchestral music, and we got to this chord, we instinctively rearrange the chord into root position. This task makes it easier for us to identify the chord and place it within the larger context of our analysis. In the 1960s and 70s, music scholars such as Alan Fort developed tools and methodologies for analyzing atonal music. Fort's pioneering book, The Structure of Atonal Music, outlines his approach to pitch class set theory, which serves as the basis for many of the topics we've discussed in this unit on the analysis of early 20th century music. Normal form, sometimes referred to as normal order, is the tool from pitch class set theory that is most analogous to the procedure of mentally putting a tertian chord into root position in order to interpret it. When a pitch class set is in normal form, it becomes much easier to see the relationships between that pitch class set and others that you have found in your analysis. The goal is to arrange the pitch class set into ascending order with the smallest possible gaps between pitch classes. We want it in its most compact form. Imagine rearranging the pitch class set into a spacing that can fit under one hand on the piano. This is done most easily using the clock face diagram. If you're unfamiliar with pitch class integers or the clock face diagram, follow the links to my previous videos in the description below. To put a pitch class set into normal form, first convert all of the pitches into integer notation and remove any duplicate pitch classes. Plot each pitch class on the clock face and observe the intervals between them. Then, reorder your pitch class set so that the largest interval, the wraparound interval, occurs between the last pitch class and the first pitch class in your set. If there are two possible ways to do this, choose the ordering that includes the smallest intervals at the left side. Note that pitch class sets in normal form will always be in some kind of ascending order, so you're always going to want to read in clockwise fashion. Here is an example of a rich musical service that only uses five pitch classes, B, E, A, C, and G sharp. This is Anton Webern's two piano arrangement of Arnold Schoenberg's famous Farben movement from his five pieces for orchestra. First, let's rename the pitch classes as integers. B is 11, E is 4, A is 9, C is 0, and G sharp is 8. Now let's arrange the pitch classes on a clock face diagram. Our goal is to reorder the set with the smallest possible gaps between the pitch classes while still keeping the notes in an ascending order. To do this, let's look at the pitch class intervals between each integer. 0 to 4 is 4 semitones, 4 to 8 is 4 semitones, 8 to 9 is 1 semitone, and 9 to 11 is 2 semitones. Next, we want to find the largest gap between two adjacent pitch classes on the clock face. Here we can see that the largest gap is 4 semitones and it occurs twice, once between pitch classes 0 and 4, and again between pitch classes 4 and 8. We want to create an ordering that has those two large intervals at the end, reading clockwise. In this example, that ordering would be 8, 9, 11, 0, 4. The 4 to 8 interval is our wraparound interval, because it would be the interval that wraps our reading back onto the starting pitch class. So, the normal form for this pitch class set would be 8, 9, 11, 0, 4. Write the pitch class set in square brackets, with each pitch class separated by a comma to ensure that it's readable. What we've done here is akin to rewriting a triad in root position in closed spacing. We've summarized the pitch class content, originally voiced across an entire orchestra, as a single five-note sonority in closed spacing. This is helpful for gaining a better aural understanding of the sonority. We could easily play it on the piano and get more comfortable with it as we study the piece. When a sonority is written out in normal form, we can also more easily make connections with other sonorities we find in the piece later on in our analysis. All told, it's a very useful tool. Let's take a look at another example to see this usefulness in action. Here is the opening three measures of Webern's Opus 5 No. 3 for string quartet. Let's take a closer look at the three note sonorities that Webern is using in the violins and viola parts. The first three note sonority, or trichord, uses the notes E flat in the viola, B in the second violin, and D in the first violin. As pitch class integers, that's 3, 11, and 2. 
When we plot these integers on the clock face, we can see that the ordered pitch class intervals that separate adjacent pitch classes are 3, 1, and 8. So 8 is our wraparound interval, and the normal form of this pitch class set is 11, 2, 3. Looking at the next trichord, we have the pitches B, G, and B flat, or as integers, 11, 7, and 10. When we plot these on the clock face, we can quickly see that the ordered pitch class intervals between adjacent pitch classes are again 3, 1, and 8 semitones. This makes the normal form of this pitch class set 7, 10, 11. You may have noticed that the ordered pitch class intervals in these two trichords are the same. That's because these two pitch class sets are transpositions of one another. This is even more noticeable when you compare the two clock faces. As you can see, we would transpose the first pitch class set by eight semitones to get to the second pitch class set. You can think of transposition of pitch class sets as turning the clock face clockwise. In our chosen analytical nomenclature, we refer to this transposition as T8, or transposition by eight semitones. Taking a quick look at the last trichord in this passage, we can see that it's also related to these two pitch class sets by transposition. The first of these pizzicato trichords is also related to these pitch class sets, but not by transposition. You'll have to wait for the next video to hear about this one. I know what you're thinking. Bryn, it was obvious that those trichords were transpositions of one another. Why do we need this fancy pitch class set theory to figure that out? While you're not wrong about that, I'll argue that this method can be used for drawing connections between musical moments that aren't so obvious. Take, for example, the contrapuntal gesture at the end of this excerpt. The first violin has the pitches D, F, E, C, F sharp, and B flat, or in integers, 2, 5, 4, 0, 6, 10. On the clock face, we can see that the normal form for this pitch class set would be 10, 0, 2, 4, 5, 6, leaving the largest gap, 6 to 10, at the end as the wraparound interval. The viola part includes the pitches A, C, B, G, C sharp, and F, or pitch class integers 9, 0, 11, 7, 1, and 5. On the clock face, it becomes clear that the normal form for this pitch class set is 5, 7, 9, 11, 0, 1, with 1 to 5 as the wraparound interval. When we look at these two clock faces side by side, we can see that they're transpositions of one another. We would transpose the first violin by seven semitones to get the pitch classes used in the viola part, so we'd say that the first pitch class set is T7 related to the second one. Conversely, we would say that the viola part is T5 related to the first violin part. While normal form is definitely an abstraction from what's going on on the musical surface, it is a standardized way of writing out these sonorities that allows us to find relationships in the music that would otherwise not be so obvious. This in and of itself makes it a useful tool for analyzing atonal music.